Hello Witch Enthusiasts! Now the past month has seen the releases of many very interesting pieces, from uh, unique and very interesting Speedmasters from Omega, to a new style of, uh, of completely different Radiomir from Panerai, and a quite remarkable piece from MBNF as per their usual norm. And so today I'd like to produce a roundup of five of the most interesting releases of the past month, bearing in mind that we have quite a f an interesting end of the year ahead of us, bearing in mind that Jean-Claude Beaver has, um, has left his, uh, his key position at LVMH, and, and we've seen other rejigs and, and shuffles around the industry. But certainly today I'd like to focus primarily upon these five watches, which I think offer very interesting elements to the industry, and bring up some interesting debates and questions. Now the first piece I'd like to speak about is a new model from Alpina, and Alpina have long been producing quite interesting GMT watches, and this piece is no exception. Because generally affordable GMT watches feature a, uh, an ETA 2894, and tend to have movements which, uh, which are not able to adapt to the, the GMT functions we would expect. And this is notably down to the fact that most GMT watches allow the, the GMT function to be adjusted independently from the other hands. The problem with this, though, is that unlike something like a Rolex GMT Master, you can't simply jump the, uh, the, the current hour hands, or the, um, the, the, the local time hour hands, that's to say the standard display for the hours, uh, backwards and forwards in between hours. And the reason why this is useful is because the, the general concept of the watch is to be able to leave the GMT function on GMT time, and then to use the rotating bezel to establish other time zones. And so as a result, it's imperative that this doesn't change when you change the time, or move between time zones. And Alpina have introduced an interesting watch in this, um, this, this configuration of a very 70s style of case, which offers you this complication at a very affordable price. And this is the new Alpina Start Timer Pilot Heritage, which is 42mm in diameter by 12mm thick, and features a very interesting, if somewhat dated, design, but one which I think will catch a great deal of eyes. There really should be no confusion, though, that this watch is a sports watch through and through. And this is seen in the fact that it features a, a very robust stainless steel case, with this attractive sunburst brushing on the top of the case, and these beautiful polished bevels. But then you also do see a 100 meter water resistance, which is uh, perfectly adequate for using this watch for extreme sports, or simply for swimming. But then there's the element which I think is most interesting, which is the use of two crowns. And the reason for these two crowns is to be able to operate the internal rotating bezel, which is seated underneath that sapphire crystal. And this allows you to move between time zones without changing the movement itself, and then of course you can use the lower crown to, uh, to operate the movement, and indeed uh, adjust the hands, the date, or that GMT function. Where the dial is concerned, one sees a very, very interesting arrangement. Because rather than using a standard GMT hand, they've used a central wheel in the centre of the dial. And whereas the rest of the dial is sunburst finished with applied indices in, um, in metal in addition to luminous markings, this is matted and resembles the, um, the, the alarm function on certain mid-century Alpinas, thus uh, giving the inspiration for this timepiece, albeit with a somewhat more mundane complication, though perhaps one that's more useful for more people. You also see a, a surrounded and, and very nicely applied date window, with the date displayed at 3 o'clock, in addition to a contrasting, uh, contrasting GMT bezel running around the edge of the dial. And of course the hands in addition to those indices are luminous, so you will be able to read the watch in the dark, though the GMT function is not, which is, um, is, is potentially a shame with that bezel, but nonetheless you'll be able to, uh, to use it quite, uh, quite easily and without too much trouble. But really it's what's going on inside this watch that's interesting, because it uses the calibre AL555, and this is a, a Salita movement which has been modified by Alpina for their purposes. And so rather than having the, the conventional um, style of, of connected GMT function, where you have, to, you have to adjust the hands as though you were adjusting a normal three-hand watch and then the GMT function separately, here it's the opposite. So you adjust the, um, the, the minutes um, as, uh, as you would normally, and uh, in addition to that the GMT function. However, the, uh, the, the hour hand can be jumped between hours, so as you change time zone by plane, you can keep up without having to reset the whole watch, which is a real convenience. And of course this continues to have all the, uh, the, 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 the standard features, obviously, to movement, running at 4 hertz, hacking and hand winding, and really a Swiss-made movement with a great deal of quality. And so as a result, this watch comes in a variety of different colours, to really contrast with the, uh, the concept of the watch as a no-nonsense sort of sports watch because it comes with a copper dial, a light blue dial, a navy dial, and a dark grey dial, each of which will appeal to a different sort of person, with the dark grey perhaps being the most versatile, and the light blue the most outlandish. And so really, bearing in mind the specifications this watch, is, this watch offers, and bearing in mind that it's from a respected brand such as Alpina, with a, a Swiss-made movement, a really very decent quality of case, and a design which is completely unmistakable, 
I think 1,395 US dollars is a, is an impressive price, really. Bearing in mind this is a significant drop by comparison to their previous 100 meter water resistant GMT watch with the same movement, which does show that Alpina are moving towards a, a more affordable segment, but still offering very solid value. The second watch I'd like to speak about is another rather interesting, if somewhat eccentric, play on a, on a very traditional function. And this is the new Ferrer Automatic Chronograph. And Ferrer is a brand which uh, is a, an Anglo-Swiss brand in terms of their watches being manufactured in Switzerland, but having a, a very British inspiration. And these are watches which are designed to be the brand's first chronograph, and indeed they're a very impressive play on, on vintage styles of chronographs, but with a very realistic um, play on them in relation to the brand's identity and their interests. And the execution here really is remarkable because the details are incredible. And the sizing of this watch is quite interesting, because it comes in a very moderate 39mm by 12.5mm thick. And it's able to be that slim because it uses uh, what is essentially an ETA2892 with a Dubois de Pra chronograph module placed on the top of it. And this means they can get that horizontal chronograph layout with the date at 6 o'clock. And also um, they're able to have a, a much thinner movement, which is a real benefit bearing in mind the almost 8mm thick uh, Veltri 7750, which is conventionally used. And they've done a very good job of decorating the movement as well, with an attractive uh, and uh, custom golden, golden rotor in addition to its full decoration on the movement plates. But the general build of the watch is stainless steel, and features brushed elements throughout, though one does have bead blasted alcoves in the sides of the case, which appear to be hewn from the very side of the case and give a, a nice contrast to something which could otherwise be a bit boring. Now in addition to the rather beautiful bronze crown used on these watches, as was the case throughout the Ferrer line, there, there is quite an interesting variation between the three versions of this watch made, because each version of the three is going to be made in a hundred pieces, and sold for the same price. But there's a very clear distinction between the, uh, the, the styles used and indeed the, um, the aim of the watch in terms of what it's trying to look like. The most immediately bold of these versions is the Cobb, which is named after John Cobb, who, who set the land speed record in 1939. And this version features the same case as the other two versions, but features this beautiful matte Prussian blue colour to it, with an orange raised tachymeter around the edge of the dial, and beautiful applied indices around its edge. Now it should also be noted that the, the subdials are asymmetrical, so you have a, a sunken style of subdial on either side, and these are steeply sunken from the rest of the dial as though a separate piece, whilst at the 3 o'clock position you have this checkerboard pattern in blue for the running seconds, and then you have this fantastic big eye style of 30 minute counter at 9 o'clock, which is formed from this gradient of blues, which creates a wonderful saturation change as you look around the dial, and offsets the yellow and the red on the dial extremely well, in addition to that matching blue date wheel. The most conservative of the three is the Seagrave, and this is named after Henry Seagrave, who, uh, who set the, the land speed and water speed record, uh, and indeed was the first person to hold both at the same time, and the first person to, to uh, reach 200 miles an hour in a land vehicle. But crucially, this design is more subtle than the other versions um, on offer, because you notice the fact that the dial is, uh, is this, this reverse panda style, and it doesn't have those steeply sunken subdials, but instead has these, um, these delicately chamfered styles of, uh, of matching subdials on either side of the dial. There are also these split indices around the dial which are applied and are a different shape to the other versions, whilst the tachymeter is blue to match the subtle hue of the dial. Then around the edge of the subdials you have this gradient of blue, which again is a mirror of the, uh, the cob, but is in many ways far more simple and far more subtle. And so this version really is for someone who wants something more discreet. The final and perhaps the most interesting version of this watch though is the Eldridge. And this is based on, uh, on the, the concept of the, the story of Ernest Eldridge, who was the last person to set a land speed record on an open road, as opposed to on a specific uh, strip of land. And I feel that with that concept, this watch does create quite a nostalgic charm, because the most striking element of the dial, which is immediately visible, is that metallic brown or perhaps tobacco to sort, of, uh, sort of tone or colour, even perhaps chocolate. But crucially, it's a more simple and perhaps more traditional design, because as you can see, the subdials are both enlarged, giving you a very high legibility um, style to this watch, in addition to elements of blue throughout, in different tones. Then the watch doesn't use applied indices, but rather uses the more old-fashioned style of Arabic numerals, which are also luminescent, as are the indices on the other versions. But crucially, this watch doesn't feature a tachymeter anymore, but a telemeter, so you can calculate distance instead of speed, as a result of the, the use of, um, of light and noise. Um, and uh, by calculating the difference, you're able to, to establish the, your, uh, you're able to establish your distance from something. But then also you're able to, uh, to, to, to use the, the chronograph subdials very clearly as a result of their enlarged size, and they are sunken, but not, not as aggressively as is seen on the cob. 
but certainly as a package I think this is the most understated, and in many ways the most beautiful. And the price for each of these limited editions of 100 is £1,675, which I don't think is unreasonable, bearing in mind the fact that they're a small brand producing a, a very interesting and very high quality product. But certainly the beauty of these watches is that they're pretty much unique on the market, and offer something which uh, really only another 100 people will have, which does give you real exclusivity, which is quite rare in the modern age of large-scale limited editions. The third watch I'd like to speak about is a piece which has been very heavily discussed for the past few weeks, and this is the, the Omega Speedmaster Hodinkee 10th Anniversary Limited Edition. And this piece is quite a curious model, because for someone who hasn't been following Hodinkee, or someone who, um, who doesn't know of them, this will make very, very little sense. But of course the vast majority of us know Hodinkee as uh, the very large and, uh, and, and incredibly influential um, watch-related uh, website and, and now magazine. And it's undeniable that what they've been able to achieve is, is remarkable in terms of, of their influence on the market, and indeed their, their position in terms of journalism on watches, so I think we can all really agree on that. And the concept for this watch was to uh, celebrate the 10th anniversary of Hodinkee. Um, they were going to remake uh, Ben Clymer, their, uh, their founder's Speedmaster Mark 40, that he was given by his maternal grandfather, and uh, which ultimately inspired him to, to create uh, Hodinkee as a concept. And so this watch was quite an important one in terms of the, the brand, in terms of celebrating an, an important anniversary. Now before discussing the merit of this particular watch, where its design is concerned, I feel it's important to understand the original watch and the original designs. Because the Mark 40 was a non-professional Speedmaster, which used a Velger 7750 as its, uh, its base automatic movement. And so as a result of that it featured upright subdials, with notable and uh, very distinctive features, such as those large, blocky and luminous Arabic numerals, enlarged black and white hands, red chronograph hands, and of course a yellow pointer date, which would move around the dial. It also featured a 24-hour indicator on the same subdial as the running seconds, which, uh, which was split between blue and black to show um, more the, the morning and the, uh, the, the afternoon. But of course, uh, unlike other Speedmasters, it doesn't run from, um, uh, from 6 to 6. Instead, it runs from, uh, from 12 to 12, which is uh, a curious touch, but still an interesting one to have. And these design elements have been transferred to the modern watch. But this piece uses a case not from a Speedmaster Professional, which was the, the case designed for the, the Mark 40, but instead goes back to the most traditional of Speedmasters currently made, which is of course the, uh, the first Omega in space. And so as a result it uses a smaller 39.7mm case, which is crown guard free and is fully symmetrical. Crucially, this design of watch uh, came before the Speedmaster Professional, and I do appreciate the fact that they've balanced the, the concept of a modern Speedmaster with a vintage Speedmaster to throw it to show the, the continued interest in this watch from uh, Hodinkee. But I feel the execution of the watch is somewhat confusing, because in many ways they've taken the design cues of the Mark 40 and forced them into the, the first Omega in space without really considering their, their impact or their importance. And of course, this is only my opinion, and I really would like to stress that, because it's still a very interesting achievement, but I do find a lot of the designs on this watch very difficult to, to, um, to understand. And notable examples of this would be the fact that this watch is, uh, is, is using um, the, the concept of its, its point-to-date hand with that yellow at end in that, uh, that aeroplane style, in, um, in balance with the same hand also being half-painted in red to show the chronograph. And for me this is a bit of a problem, because of course the original yellow and that different shape of hand was like on the Speedmaster Mark series watches, designed to differentiate between the chronograph and another hand, and not simply amalgamate the two. Likewise the running seconds are split to show the fact that the original had two hands, with a, a double-ended hand painted blue on one side and black on the other. But the problem with this really is that now the, uh, the running seconds are virtually unusable, unless you really stare at them and establish exactly which hand you're looking at, or which one you set the watch to. And so for those reasons, I do find this watch isn't really a triumph of functionality over design, because of course that was the original concept of the Speedmaster, and it was never really designed to be, uh, to, to be a, a dressy sort of watch, but rather a professional piece. However, that certainly doesn't mean that I can't appreciate the design of this watch, with its beautiful blue-grey dial and its manually wound 1861 calibre, in addition to that, uh, that, uh, that aluminium bezel insert. But I feel as a concept that the watch is perhaps a bit misguided, but nonetheless, if you want a very interesting limited edition watch, this could well have been a very interesting option. Though of course at the present time I believe they are all sold out, having been sold in only 500 pieces for 6,500 US dollars. This penultimate watch is a piece which in many ways shouldn't work as a concept, and it's a new Panerai. However, I must admit that for me the design of this watch wins me over completely. I think it's a wonderful looking timepiece, and a very clever one at that, in terms of incorporating history into a really brilliant Italian design. 
And this is the Panerai Radiomir 1943 Days Achayo, with, um, with a rather unique dial. Now, the background of this watch is that the dial on this watch is designed after the, the pendulum clocks, which, which were made by, uh, by Panerai's um, initial uh, creator, Giovanni Panerai, in Florence in the late 19th century. And so they've incorporated this dial into what is a fundamentally a Second World War uh, military diving case, which is, of course, the Radiomir. But I feel the way they've incorporated these two elements with a very impressive movement is a very, very clever design, and one which I think will please whoever the owners of these watches end up being. But where the general case design is concerned, it has a 47mm polished stainless steel case with this wonderful cushion shape and the later 1940 Radiomir style lugs, which are built into the case and are far less fiddly to change the straps on than the conventional Radiomir. It does also feature the later 1940 crown, which is sunken into the case instead of being a, an exposed onion crown, which means this watch will generally be a more subtle design feature and a design element, but will nonetheless be a highly, uh, highly uh, versatile, but also highly bold statement if you do choose to wear it. These watches also uh, bridge the gap between sports watch and dress watch, because whilst their dials, as I'll explain later, are very simple, minimalistic, but also very beautiful, they still retain 100 meter water resistance, and so are able to compete very, very well with other marine watches. But really with these watches, Panerai have emphasised the vintage element to these watches. And that's hardly a limited feature on most Panerais, but they really have pushed the boat out with this piece. Now it should be noted that no military Panerai was ever seen with a dial of this style, nor did one ever have hands of this style. These are a pure fabrication, based upon the, uh, the designs of Panerai's past, but in a very charming way. Because seated beneath the, the heavily domed plexiglass crystal these watches have on the front, which again is an abnormal choice for Panerai, one has a dial which comes in two versions. Now, the most, uh, the most subtle, I feel, of the two is the black version, and this features a matte black base with a, a railway-style uh, minute track around its edge and, and two rings of gold around the centre to, to run around the edge of the, the hour hand track. To match these details, the watches feature these wonderful Art Deco-style numerals, which add a, a real sense of, uh, of balance to these watches, and give a real flair. In addition to these, you see Radiomir Panerai, which is signed in gold as well, and on the black dial version you have these beautiful and uniquely formed faceted metal hands, which reflect light wonderfully. The other alternative is the ivory dialed version, and these feature dials which are certainly not white, but give this very clean, but extremely soft colour to them, which I think is wonderful, and would be my choice of the two because this watch really bridges the, the, the gap between a dress watch and a sports watch. You also see the fact that between those rings which were in gold on the black dialed version, you have this dark beige or brown, which again adds contrast and detail to these watches, and, and appears almost architectural in its design. Then the numerals which also match are finished in dark grey, which beautifully match all of the, the, uh, the markings on the dial, including the, the Radiomir Panerai writing, and the hands which are beautifully fastened in metal again, but this time a grey. Inside this watch, Panerai have used their P3000 calibre, which is a manually wound calibre with two spring barrels. And uh, this, this watch has a few interesting features in terms of its, uh, it, its, its operation, because it features a 72-hour, three-day power reserve, which is useful if you want to, to not have to wind the watch every day. But also it features a, a movement of the hour hand in one-hour increments, and what this means is that if you're moving between time zones, you can jump the hour hand without stopping the watch and corrupting the timekeeping which is a very helpful feature, albeit less helpful on a watch which doesn't have a second hand, uh, which, uh, which would otherwise be disturbed by the change of the hours. But certainly I feel that the, the price of €8,900 for these watches, which are limited editions of 300 pieces of each colour, is certainly a steep price, but I think that for a, a Panerai collector, these certainly are worth the price, because they're beautiful demonstrations of what Panerai can do when they really think about a new design. The final watch I'd like to speak about is a remarkable piece from mb &F. And MB&F consistently produce these quite remarkable timepieces, with a design which is completely unique, and a build which is truly mad in its forms. And this is by no means a disappointment, it's the HM9, or the uh, Horological Machine 9, Flow. And this is a piece which is inspired by the, the, uh, the streamlined cars of the 1930s and 40s, and uh, examples such as the Mercedes and Auto Union racing streamlined cars of the 30s really do spring to mind. These were cars which were designed before, uh, before wind tunnels, before technology like computers that were able to calculate the drag coefficient of a car. Instead, cars were simply smoothed out, as were aeroplanes. And so this watch celebrates that form in its, uh, its design. And the design of the case is extremely different to anything else on the market. It has these pods of these modular sort of forms which create the build-up of this aerodynamic shape. 
And to match the rather spectacular concept behind these watches, they're, uh, they're extremely large as well, at 57mm by 47mm by 23mm. However, they are heavily curved, and so they will sit against the wrist, but there's no danger of ever getting one of these under a shirt cuff. But I think that's b beside the point, because they've really used technology to make these novelty items. These are spectacular timepieces for, for great eccentrics. They're made out of grade 5 titanium as well to keep the weight down, and feature this design where the movement is integrated into the case shape to create a, a truly spectacular form. Of course, brushed and polished finishes have been used extensively on this watch to create this sort of uh, celebration of sci-fi forms throughout the watch. And the most striking elements of the watch are the, the fact that it has these two balance wheels. And the reason why it has these two balance wheels, which are visible through these, um, these heavily bubble-formed sapphire crystals, is that they, like a Philippe Dufour duality, balance each other out to give you higher accuracy from the watch, which is something which is not necessarily a necessary feature, but is a wonderful thing to have nonetheless on the timepiece. And this concept of function following form is continued as the movement runs then down via its, um, its general body to the dial, which is placed horizontally as opposed to with its vertical orientation on a normal watch. And this means that you have to look at it from the side, but it gives you this small dial in two versions. Because you can either get a, uh, the air version, which features a Flieger-style dial, or the road version, which features a, a, um, a speedometer style of dial. And either way, these watches have movements which are matched to their dial versions, with the flight or the air version featuring a blackened movement, whilst the version with the, the road-style dial features uh, a gilt sort of plating over the rest of the movement to create a, a sort of a, a contrasting air. And of course this creates a sense of, of luxury or darkness to these watches, depending on their function, but both I think look truly fantastic. Now these watches are only being made in a very small number of pieces, being 33 pieces each, for a quite staggering price of 182,000 US dollars. And whilst it's very difficult to, to, to state that this price is, is good value in any sense of the term, these are incredible watches in terms of what they're able to perform, and are quite a, a feat of technology and mastery of high horology in terms of being able to make a movement to fit a case, as opposed to the other way around, which is a, is a feat of technology and a really baffling attention to detail for this brand, which is the reason why I adore MBNF in terms of the designs and the creations they make. And so I'll conclude the video there, but do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of this video, and indeed of the watches I've shown, in addition to any favourites you might have had. And so if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to, to view more videos and content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Arm on the Watch Guy, out.